Hey guys, Hop here. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we are finally going to close the books on the Ruger SFAR, the short frame auto loading rifle. This looks probably a little bit different than the last time you saw it on the channel and substantially different than the way that it comes from the factory, but it will now cycle all types of ammunition, both suppressed and unsuppressed. So today we're going to go over what we had to do to get this thing to be actually reliable. And then we're gonna go over the way I have it set up because I think this configuration is a very good fit for the Ruger SFAR. Let's get into it. This video was made possible by supporters of the channel on Subscribestar and today's sponsor, Venture Surplus. More about them in a bit. Check out the links in the video description for ways to support the show, and thank you for watching. I desperately wanted to like the Ruger SFAR, but damn, they didn't make it easy. I'm not wild about the interrupted top rail on the factory handguard, but in the last video we covered how that's easy to swap for almost any AR-15 compatible handguard. The big hurdle keeping me from recommending the SFAR is reliability. My original sample of the SFAR was totally non-functional. It was crazy undergassed on all settings, with major gas leakage from the gas regulator. I sent it back to Ruger, and their diagnosis was that the gas regulator was out of spec, so they replaced it with an entirely new rifle. My second SFAR has been much better. We've put a bunch of rounds through it, and it's mostly reliable, but nowhere close to being reliable enough to bet your life on. The SFAR has a 4 position gas regulator, starting at 0 for off, then 1 for suppressed use, 2 for normal use, and 3 for adverse conditions or underloaded ammunition. In theory, the rifle should cycle basically anything unsuppressed on setting 2 after the break-in period of approximately 200 rounds. However, even on my replacement rifle, setting 2 seems undergassed, leading to infrequent failures to feed. Even an infrequent failure is too frequent, in my opinion. Unfortunately, we can't just crank the gas up to setting 3 to solve that problem. Ruger cautions against using the adverse setting too much because the rifle will beat itself to death, but what's worse is that setting 3 isn't reliable either. With normal 7.62 ball ammo, we've had multiple failures to extract. It seems like the gun is so overgassed on setting 3 that the extractor is ripping off the edge of the cartridge case. This is gas setting 3 with 175 grain Sierra Match King 308. Failure to extract. Ah, oh, shit, dude. Something I always keep in the truck is a cleaning rod, but I don't actually have a cleaning rod in the truck. I have an antenna that I took off my old truck. Yeah, this thing is obviously way the fuck over gassed. It shredded the rim of the case. Son of a bitch. It's possible my second sample of the SFAR is still an outlier, but I did browse around through various forums to try to see how common these issues are, and I found a number of complaints about both reliability and accuracy. We'll get back to the accuracy later. I think the issue with this rifle is that four settings on the gas regulator just isn't enough, especially because they wasted one on an off position. If you really want quieter operation with a suppressor and the single shot accuracy of a bolt action, well, Ruger already makes one of those. It's called the Ruger American. So if setting 2 is undergassed and setting 3 is overgassed, obviously we need to replace the gas system and find ourselves a nice middle ground. I really didn't want to do that, but I also really didn't want to keep using a car antenna to knock stuck cases out of the chamber. Jesus Christ. No dice? God damn. Stuck case. Ah, <sighs> fuck. I think I know what the F stands for. Today's video is brought to you in part by Venture Surplus. I've bought a ton of gear from them over the years, so I'm pleased to have them as a channel sponsor for the first time. Venture specializes in military surplus gear and clothing, mostly from the US. 
If you're watching this video on release, Venture's Black Friday sale is going on right now, and coincidentally, it's time to gear up for winter. High quality cold weather gear tends to be very expensive when you buy it brand new, but you can build up a layering system with Milserp for way cheaper, and as a bonus, it'll be in subdued colors or camo patterns, instead of this season's trendy neon vomit that makes you look like you got tarred and feathered outside an REI. The M81 parka you see me wearing in some of my videos is one I bought from Venture, and it's awesome. But no, you can't have it. They don't show up on the surplus market very often. That's just the way it goes with Milserp. Once something sells out, it might be gone forever. Click the link in the video description to check out Venture Surplus. A big thank you to them for supporting the channel. Now, let's get back to the show. The appeal of the SFAR's stock gas regulator is that it's simple and quick to adjust. A regular adjustable gas block is not fast to adjust. Most of them either have set screws, which are infinitely variable, or something like the superlative arms, which has 48 settings. That does allow you to dial in the absolute perfect amount of gas for one ammo type and one configuration, but counting out 20 indistinct adjustment clicks every time you take the suppressor off is not my idea of a good time. We're looking for something that is easy to adjust and rugged, but also has more than the four gas settings of the stock gas regulator. One option is the POF Dictator Gas Block. These have nine settings, they're very fast and easy to adjust, and you get to enjoy the delicious irony of using a POF part to fix Ruger's knockoff of the POF Rogue. It's like poetry, it rhymes. The other option, and the one that I went with, is the Rifle Speed Adjustable Gas Block. These have a good blend of granularity, ruggedness, and they are quick to adjust. Instead of using a screwdriver or a hex wrench or something to adjust the gas, the Rifle Speed Gas Block has a large extended collar that you can just twist with your fingers, and it has 12 settings, which is an ample number. I have my reservations about the durability and reliability of most adjustable gas blocks, but the Rifle Speed is a totally different animal. So I swapped the factory gas regulator out for the rifle speed, and I swapped from the 12.625 inch Midwest combat rail to an 11.5 inch Midwest combat rail to allow access to the rifle speed adjustment collar. The results from the rifle speed were very promising. The rifle works unsuppressed at setting 10 and suppressed at setting 4, which is a good sign because that leaves a bit of extra adjustment in the system to account for fouling, different ammunition, or different suppressors with different levels of back pressure. We can dial up to 11 or 12 as an adverse setting, or down below setting 4 if using a higher back pressure can or hotter ammunition. It also seems likely that we could shoot subsonic ammo with a suppressor and the gas turned way up. The rifle speed gas block seems to be the best of both worlds. We get more granularity than the stock gas regulator, but we also retain the fast, easy adjustment and the ability to go from suppressed to unsuppressed settings without using tools or an Excel spreadsheet showing how many turns it takes to get to the center of the gas adjustment lollipop. All right, so we are on rifle speed gas setting 10, which should cycle unsuppressed, or at least it did earlier. Complete lockback. And the suppressor setting that we found earlier was four. Lock back. Rifle speed to the rescue. So what about the accuracy issues? That seems to be a common complaint on the forums as well. As far as both of my samples of the SFAR, as well as the one that Luke C. reviewed for TFB, they were more than accurate enough for the POU. I think the overlap between people who want a sub-minute precision rifle and people who want an ultralight hunting rifle is pretty small. 308 rifles are also a lot more ammo picky in my experience, so it could just be that somebody who's used to getting really good results out of one brand of ammunition should be trying a couple of different loads when they pick up an SFAR. There is some speculation online that the accuracy issues with the SFAR are caused by the handguard coming into contact with the gas regulator. If the rail flexes even a tiny bit, it will hit the gas regulator on the top. It doesn't take that much force to cause the stock handguard to flex a little bit, and since it's a 15-inch handguard, any pressure put towards the end, such as by, for example, a bipod or a bag or a nest rest, is very likely to cause the handguard to flex just enough to come into contact with the gas regulator, which is only a few inches behind the end of the handguard. 
Swapping the SFAR over to the rifle speed gas block and the Midwest handguard is not a solution. There is still almost no clearance with this setup. There's probably a combination of handguard and gas system out there that will work, like the suppressor style handguards for Midwest Industries or one of the more old school large diameter handguards that uses a much larger barrel nut compared to the popular modern style of ultra low profile friction fit rails. All right, so let's go over how we have the SFAR set up. This is a Midwest Industries combat rail, just a regular free float M-lock. This one is 11 and a half inches long, and that's so that we have clearance for the rifle speed gas block uh, adjustment knob up at the front. If you used one of the longer rifle speed adjustment controls, then you could have a longer handguard, but this is the one that I've got. This is the handguard that uh, fits. So a 12.5 would be too long. 11.5 is just right, at least for this configuration. At the muzzle, we've got a YHM SRX brake. This is the short brake. This doesn't provide a huge amount of braking force, which is kind of a bummer. If you're shooting this thing unsuppressed, you really feel the lack of that original tanker brake on there. This thing is a little bit lighter than a standard SFAR, and it also kicks really hard. So uh, a more effective brake maybe would be nice, but mostly we just want it there as a place to mount our suppressor. This is a YHM R9, not the best can for this gun by any stretch, but it's the one that I've got. As far as the lower goes, we still have the Magpul MOE grip, Magpul SL stock. However, we are using the uh, added, the thicker rubber spacer on the stock. These are a little bit softer than the rubber that comes on the, uh, on the stock out of the box. A little bit helps because this is very light, kicks very hard, so just a little bit more cushion. Especially nice if you're shooting in a weird position and you end up right up against your collarbone instead of actually deep in your the sh uh, pocket of your shoulder. Trigger, still the, the Ruger Elite two-stage trigger. Don't see any reason to change that whatsoever. We do have a Magpul dust cover, and that's just because the uh, original dust cover will fall out if we use this uh, style of handguard. Weapon light is an Arisaka 600 on an inline mount. This is with the E2HT, so the hyper throw head. They make thicker heads that have more throw, but we don't really need them. It's just on a Arisaka momentary tail cap, so you can activate it with your support hand thumb. Super easy, barely an inconvenience at all. Sling is a Ferro Concept Slingster. It's attached at the front with a Blue Force Gear UWL, I believe, the wire loop. Uh, this can just thread right through the slots in the handguard and it fits nicely underneath the weapon light. So it doesn't get in the way, uh, doesn't require the use of a sling swivel, which would bind up against the body of the light, kind of cause a problem. Also in the upper, we have got a suppressor optimized charging handle to Radiant Raptor SD. This thing is incredibly gassy and this charging handle really can't do much to help, but again, every little bit helps. Hopefully this isn't a high volume of fire gun or you're really gonna get gassed out. Oh. Oh. <coughs> Jesus Christ. Just fucking ate all of that. Optic is a Trigicon AccuPoint TR24 1 to 4. I believe this is the 2G, so it's the single green dot illuminated duplex reticle. This is a very lightweight and rugged scope. It has a decent 1X, and the fact that it has some form of illumination that doesn't require the use of batteries is kind of a nice feature. Uh, the 4X on this scope is not very good. The image really falls apart and looks very soupy. Uh, that's just common to all of uh, Trigicon's 1 to 4s, unfortunately. Uh, the one to six would be a much nicer scope, but it's also well, it's more expensive and it's also substantially heavier. This thing is also in an Aero Precision 30 millimeter ultralight mount. Keep the whole package weight very low. These things don't have throw levers. They just have a little rubber cock ring thing at the back here. So it's very slow to adjust the 4X. But again, since the 4X is not something we expect to be using all the time, not a big deal. The other optic choice that would work very well on this type of rifle would be a micro prism like the Primary Arms SLX 3X or maybe the 2X, uh, something with some subtensions and a little bit of zoom to take farther shots. I tried this for a little bit with the 5X micro prism, but I didn't really like that one. I think it's just uh, not nearly as usable as the 3X, so that extra magnification sort of just getting in the way. With the Midwest rail, the base weight of this rifle is, again, a little bit lighter than the factory. The rifle speed gas block is bigger and heavier than the factory gas regulator, but we've also dropped off another inch of rail from when we had the 12.625 rail on here with the factory gas system. So, you know, we're just <laughs> shaving weight anywhere we can find it, I guess. Back to Hop in the Studio for the conclusion. So can we give the SFAR a recommendation now or not? Out of the box, the Ruger SFAR still only really makes sense to me as a lightweight rifle for hunting. It's lighter than a lot of bolt-action rifles with the improved ergonomics of the AR platform and, of course, way more firepower. 
Toss a lightweight direct thread suppressor on there, keep it on gas setting number one, and it should be reliable enough for that purpose. If you really like this platform and you're willing to spend money on it, you can use it as the basis for a pretty cool build. The rifle is still so lightweight that even if you have to add a heavier handguard to get the capability you want to out of it, the end result will still be lightweight. It's highly likely that you'll need to replace the gas system too, and when all is said and done, the price will start approaching that of other rifles that are just a bit nicer. The aforementioned POF Rogue, for example. Although it's worth noting that the Rogue does not have an adjustable gas system out of the box, so it's not an ideal suppressor host. But there are other 308 rifles out there that are a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier than the SFAR, but certainly a lot more dependable, like my beloved SIG 716i Tread. Hopefully, this video equips you guys with the knowledge you need to make your own decision. As for me, I still cannot give the SFAR a blanket recommend, but I do really like it. That's all for today. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you like this channel, please subscribe, and if you'd like to support me directly, there are links in the video description to my Subscribestar page, as well as my Linktree page. If you join Subscribestar, you get access to early videos, bonus videos, Discord stuff, whatever, and if you click on the Linktree link, you'll find affiliate, sponsor, and social media stuff, if that's what you're into. As always, I'll see you guys next time.